Welcome everyone to our Tech Minds Unwind series. My name is Vidhi and I work in the Silicon Valley in the tech industry. We'll discuss insights and tools that are available to you so that you can infuse them in your day-to-day -day lives. In this episode, we'll be joined by Linnea Butler. Linnea was formerly a scientist and biotech marketer and is the founder and owner of Bay Area Mental Health, which is a group psychotherapy and psychiatry practice based in the heart of Silicon Valley. Linnea will discuss why being burnt out in the tech industry is so normalized and how that attitude could be harmful to maintain. Hello, Linnea. I'm so glad to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Vidi. And I think what you're doing with this, this show is really important and really timely. Thank you so much. All right, let's jump in. So tell us about your three different careers. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> it would seem on the surface that the three careers have nothing to do with each other, from molecular biology and research to marketing and now to psychotherapy. And the skills that I learned as a scientist come in very handy when I'm looking at new technologies for mental health, new approaches, but also just the sort of foundational, fundamental skill of critical thinking. So I use that all the time. And then the work I did in marketing gave me a deep understanding about how to conceptualize either business to business or business to, to consumer communications. And that feeds into both my role as a psychotherapist and also as a, as a practice owner. And I'm excited to bring some of those insights here today. And ultimately, as a therapist, this is the career that fills my soul the most. And so each time I was in a career, I loved what I was doing, but this is much more nurturing to sort of the essence of who I am. And it's also the result of lifelong self-exploration that brought me to where I am today. That's very inspiring. Okay, so then let's just address the elephant in the room. It's like, what is with burnout and the tech industry? Yes. Well, I think burnout certainly is not exclusive to the tech industry, but the tech industry is well known for burnout. And it has been for quite some time. And I do think that it is normalized in, in tech. So for example, when I was working in biotech marketing, it was almost a badge of honor the worse you looked when you came into the office, if you had big bags under your eyes, if you were like, oh God, I'm so tired, I was working till three in the morning. That, that was the general water cooler conversation. And I remember thinking that if I wasn't sending emails at two o'clock in the morning, I was slacking. And it was just sort of expected. And I've worked in small startups, you know, under 30 people, and I've worked in medium to large size tech organizations. And the message is sort of the same. It's always like that. And if you're doing a push, let's say you have a launch coming or a new release or a product roadshow, something like that, then of course you're going to have those days where it's all hands on deck and you do what needs to be done. And that's fine, provided you have time to rest in between. And what's happened is, that that availability for rest time has gone away and so the hard push has become the normal and it just doesn't work we are not built for that kind of sustained level of stress we're built for periods of high stress interspersed with periods of rest and recovery and we don't get that yeah anything in particular why you think this is for the tech industry as much is it because of the people that you've seen so far in your life in your clinical practice or just you live in the Bay Area, so things that you see around you or even your husband's lifestyle as well. So Yes, yeah. well, my husband has been in the tech industry his whole career. From the early days of networking, he's, he's done startups. Well, most of his career has been startups in tech. And the, the market has changed dramatically and it's evolved. So let's, let's go back to around 2000 when we were in the, the tech boom. And there was so much innovation happening. It was so exciting and there were all these new ideas and plenty of space to create new ideas and disruptive technologies. And once you establish a disruptive technology, then you have the ability to iterate on that and it creates more and more opportunity. That was a very exciting time, but it can't last forever. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that has happened is we're moving into, we're moving away from early stage capitalism and into late stage capitalism. Mm -hmm. And the opportunities for innovation have gone down at the moment. Now, with, the, with AI coming on board, we're probably going to see another explosion of innovations because this is a disruptive technology. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is if you don't have space for new innovation, new products, new markets, you have to create 
new income and profit in some way. Because big organizations, you have shareholders and they demand a return on their investment. If you're not creating something new, then the only thing left is to do more with less. And that has been happening for decades in the tech industry. Mm. And initially, you can build in some efficiencies and you can get profit that way. But over time, there's more and more of a squeeze on the folks doing the work to get more done. And that is increasing the stress level and increasing the burnout. Now, COVID accelerated everything. But one of the things that, that COVID did is it moved a lot of work to telehealth, which actually has been wonderful in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But people get Zoom fatigue. But Zoom fatigue has actually, I think, increased some of the burnout in the early days because we just got tired of sitting on a screen. Mm -hmm. And we are designed, we are evolutionarily adapted to be social creatures. We need to be in contact with people. And when we lose that face-to-face, -face, there is something that cannot be replaced by telehealth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about this podcast that you're doing is it's in person. So even though our, you know, the viewers are not here, we're still modeling that person interaction. Yeah. And not having that decreases our resilience to stress, and that would increase the burnout rates as well. Yeah. And then, on top of that, so there's so many layers to this, on top of that, now there's a big push to go back in person. And a lot of people who have been doing telehealth for the last three years don't want to do it. And so there's stress with that, too. Anyway, that, that's sort of a, a snapshot of how I see the, the landscape. No, I think that's well put. Yes. Now that's where we are. Things are normalized. And burnout is normalized in the tech industry, especially after COVID. It's like people do not want to agree that they went through a pandemic mm -hmm. and something happened. And the way things are working and the way burnout is working and the way teams are working is fine because it's supposed to work that way. It's sort of like the, the book and the movie, The Perfect Storm. Oh, but yeah. all these factors come together. In that case, it was about a storm that never should have happened unless you have everything hitting at just the right time. We are in that right now with burnout. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was struggling with, let's say, mild depression or anxiety, it went up mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And maybe it's moderate to severe now. Or maybe somebody had trauma history, but those traumas got re-triggered by the isolation or by the political division in the world and in particular in our country that has also increased stress. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing so many different factors that are impacting the burnout that's happening right now. And then in short, it's just not sustainable. We have to find a new way of working, a new way of living, a new way of achieving that balance, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the whole point of the series that you're doing yeah. is how to find balance. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But going back, it's also said that once in a lifetime, everyone that lives around here will have some or the other mental illness at some point. Maybe it's anxiety or depression, and I think COVID just expedited all of it because of all the loneliness, all the sadness, everything that it brought along with it. So yeah, this is it's going to be a different time once we see the after effects of this in the next few years, for sure. Yes, Yeah. and we will continue to see the fallout, as you said, for the next several years. Yeah. All right, so then what would burnout look like in the tech industry or like in a tech workplace? Like, what would you have to say about things like multitasking? Is that normal, <laughs> really multitasking? Because I feel like, a lot of us have three monitors for a reason. It's because every monitor is doing something different. Yes. And how does that affect us later in life? I'm really glad you asked the multitasking question. It's funny because I always prided myself on being very good at multitasking. And actually, in most companies that I worked for, the annual review would include a section on how good are you at multitasking. Oh. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm good. I can multitask. And this was in the days of the, uh, the Blackberries, the Crackberries. And I had my Blackberry in one hand, I had my personal cell phone in another, and I had an email I was trying to read. I was trying to listen to a voicemail, have a conversation, and read an email at the same time. And wow. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Because obviously none of it was working. Yeah. That was my first sign that I got a little overboard on this attempt to multitask. And it was, I had to step back and laugh at myself at this moment. Like, yeah. who are you? And at the, around this time, I began to learn about mindfulness. And one of the things I was taught is that multitasking is not possible. And what I learned is that we actually can't do two things at once. What we do is called context switching. Mm -hmm. And you can go from one task to a next. And I, I'm very good at switching between tasks. A little bit of ADD flavor in there. My mind is always thinking about multiple things at once. But every time you do that, every time you switch, you lose a little bit of momentum. So in reality, number one, there's no such thing as multitasking. Mm -hmm. Number two, context switching is not efficient, even if you do it quickly, because you lose a little bit of time each time you switch. So it's actually much more efficient 
to do things like time blocking or when I, when I worked in a company where we had a lot of engineers, they all had headphones on as they were coding, right? Because they don't want distractions. Yeah. Because distractions will interrupt the flow of what they're doing. Yeah. No, very well put. It's, it's, my brain is starting to rethink every time that I multitask and how I should find a way to alert myself to not do it next. So I'm already thinking on how I look up. But yeah, if you have any tips or tricks where you can have someone remind themselves while they're multitasking that, hey, stop. Actually, I do. Oh, great. There is an app for the phone called Mindfulness Bell. Okay. And you can program it to ring at very specific intervals or at random intervals. And all it does is it makes a little ding. Oh, okay. And when you hear that ding, it's a reminder to come back to the moment. And it's not specific for multitasking, but if you are multitasking and you hear that little bing, it's like, oh, I need to come back. Yeah, no, that those are great tips. I'll make sure I link that here. And I feel like I need to use it as well, just to come back in the moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's jump into more of what do you think are the causes and reasons for these burnouts? On top of everything that we've discussed, like anything specific to the tech industry where we create an environment apart from normalizing it. In tech in particular, whether it's software or hardware, for hardware, it's a little bit longer. For software, it's very quick. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, dot releases. And so that innovation cycle has gotten much faster, right? And if you're doing, if, let's say you're doing software development and you're doing dot releases, it's like boom, boom, boom. You're always on top of a new release. Mm -hmm. And there are only, so you're, you used to be a product manager, still yeah, a product manager. Yeah. I had that role as well. And you only have three levers you can play with, either the requirements, the time or the resources. Yeah. And it, there's not a lot of flexibility there. When you have, if you're in a larger company, if you have announced a release, you cannot flex on the time. If you promise certain features, you can't flex on those features. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have enough resources, most companies will not hire to fill that out. And so it's more pressure on the existing people. Yeah. Now, one of the things that started happening a lot in the dot-com boom is that base salaries went down and people were compensated with stock options. In fact, my first startup, we all went to go see Mission Impossible, I think it was the second one, mm -hmm. and there's a line in there where the, the criminal is like, no, I want stock options, and yeah. we all, you know, <laughs> the whole team is cracking up laughing because we all signed up for the stock options. Yeah. Stock options are going to motivate people to work harder because you're going after that achievement that has a, a very high risk-reward reward mm -hmm. relationship. And so that again that can happen in short bursts but you can't sustain it mm -hmm. and so that rapid development cycle is not sustainable if you have the same people doing the push all the time i see so it's like the high risk gets some sort of adrenaline in you to just go up to keep churning and then that churn keeps pushing you because yeah you have releases to deliver to so it's a thrill in the beginning but then it turns into burnout very quickly so yes it's not an efficient model at some point to continue yes. into there's actually a researcher at Stanford named Sapolsky, mm -hmm. and he wrote a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I, and he's also got a couple of TED Talks. I highly recommend watching the TED Talks or reading his book. And he, he studies cortisol and adrenaline stress responses in baboons. Mm. And he studies them in baboons because the structure of their society is actually very similar to the structure of human society. And we are designed to have short bursts of stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, and that's fine, and that gets us out of, you know, if a predator is chasing us, we need that short burst to be able to run away or, you know, whatever the short-term urgency is. But what happens is if that stress response does not go down, we, we're not designed to have cortisol running through our body at all times. Mm -hmm. But when it does, that leads to adrenal fatigue. When your adrenals get tired, you don't have the energy, so you start pounding the coffee, and you lean on coffee and maybe other stimulants, Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great reminder because I think a lot of people keep running, thinking it will show up every morning because that coffee mug will show up and that's what will keep pushing me. But at some point, that coffee mug also will stop working. Yes. And your body will also stop giving you the things that you need to keep churning. Yeah. Yeah. So what would be the common signs of burnout that someone who's watching right now can understand that they are feeling burnout as well? Mm -hmm. One of the things I tell people to look for is when you start having friends and family say, are you okay? Maybe you need to take a little break. Mm -hmm. So friends and family or coworkers expressing concern, that is a big sign because usually other people see it before we do. I remember I was at a, a sales meeting this was in the biotech world. I was working for BD Biosciences at the time. And we had an afternoon off and I had elected to go get a massage. And one of my coworkers said, 
oh, thank God, you really need one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, oh, I guess my stress levels are apparent to other people. Yeah. So that's one. Another one is an increase in irritability, mm-hmm. where things are really hitting you sideways, and you're much more irritable than you normally would be. What I look for in me personally is I start to get more cranky when I'm driving in traffic. Mm-hmm. And if I start getting irritable when I'm driving, and I'm like, oh, that person cut me off, you terrible person, you... Like, that's a sign to me that something is going on. It's mm-hmm. not about the traffic, it's that my tolerance level has dropped because my stress level has increased. So those are things to look for. Changes in sleep patterns, either you're sleeping more than you usually do or you're sleeping less. Those are indicative. Major depressive disorder often includes a change in sleeping patterns. Mm-hmm. Okay. And would these be like micro, so tell me about like micro irritations where in your everyday life you just get so used to getting irritated with several things, maybe you forget altogether that you're getting irritated, which is where I think you sort of have to take inventory then. Just be like, okay, this is a different feeling today mm-hmm. out of irritation. Because I feel I went through that in COVID where I was so irritated with everything, I forgot that every day waking up with irritation is not normal. <laughs> Right. So there's an internal normalization that's happening. Yeah. Right. Well, of course I'm stressed. And if I start getting snappy to my husband or, you know, I trip over my cat and I'm convinced that he's trying to trip me on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, all of those things. Those are, I yes. think, good signs. But Because I feel like not only me, a lot of people around me got very used to being okay with being irritated every day. So like this is yes. how you wake up. But that's not normal. And that's no. what we need to like understand and do something about so, okay, Th- those are very good signs. And reversing that normalization internally is really important. Yeah. And it's, that's the hardest place to do it because you actually have to look inward. And we don't tend to do that enough. But, yeah. So, I know we covered points on being short-tempered, but is there anything else that you want to cover related to tech and being short-tempered? In terms of signs of burnout? Yeah. Well, being short-tempered would be an external sign. Internally, you might start to feel much more resentful. Mm. You might wake up in the morning with a case of the us. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to do this. You have mental blocks. You have no access to creativity. And actually, if you are in a role that demands creativity, like if you are in a startup or if you're coding or doing new product development and you don't have access to that creativity, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So that is one sign of burnout Mm -hmm. because you cannot access creativity while you are burned out. So, yeah, thank you for that. And what would be some strategies or tools that you suggest for all of these issues that we've talked about that you have. The most important thing to me is increasing self-awareness. So, uh, and to me, the best tool for that is informal mindfulness practices. But even if that's not comfortable, you can do, you can like download a, a free mindfulness app. There are so many right now. Insight Timer is one of my favorites. Yeah, and it's I free. do. Yeah. I do. <clears throat> and the more you practice that, the more you'll get in tune with what's happening inside. Because it's a lot easier to prevent burnout than to recover from it. Recovering from burnout is very difficult. Mm. So please don't let yourself get all the way there because it's hard to come back. As someone who has been there, yeah. it is hard to come back. And you often need to take quite a bit of time off just to be quiet to recover. So number one is increasing your level of self-awareness. So you can spot the warning signs. Mm-hmm. Number two is rest. And actually there's a wonderful book written by Emily and Amelia Nagoski called Burnout. Mm. Highly recommend it. And there's a whole chapter there based on sleep, but, but they, they speak a lot about the quality of rest. And let me be very clear, rest, true rest is not what we think it is. Binging Netflix is not restful. Mm. That is, even though you're like maybe laying down a couch, that's not restful. Mm. Watching TV of any sort, not restful. Reading a book, not restful. Rest is lying down quietly without distractions, or it could be going for a walk in nature. Mm. We need a lot of rest. And this counteracts the the rest and digest phase is how you recover from the stress phase. And you need to be able to go back and forth. And we don't go to the rest and digest phase. So that's going to be very important. Now, there are skills that you can use. Coping skills, part of what we teach in DBT. These are life skills that help us deal with emotions. And that can help you to become more self-aware, but also to figure out how to increase your resilience to difficult emotions. Let's jump into the other part which we discussed, which was self-compassion, self-acceptance. Okay. Another thing I want to mention is the importance of self-compassion work. My husband calls it woo-woo, that I embrace and I love. And yes, I have crystals in my office. I absolutely do. But I'm also a scientist at heart. Mm. And so there's a level of natural skepticism that I hold. Curiosity combined with skepticism, you know, show me the data. That that scientist in my soul is never going to go away. I always am curious about data. 
And when I first heard about self-compassion work, I was like, oh, that sounds very fluffy to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, not so surprising, I struggle with it myself. It's, you know, when, when you come from an environment where you're hard on yourself, the idea of self-compassion feels almost threatening. Mm. It feels too soft, right? Kristen Neff is sort of the, the thought leader right now on self-compassion work. And I think that self-compassion is a big missing piece in our culture. And there's more and more movement toward it now, but we are at the infancy mm -hmm. of that work. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. You can practice it as simply as just, it's okay. It's okay. Almost imagining yourself as a child that you're comforting, yeah. giving yourself grace. And it's actually much more powerful than it sounds. I, I'm saying this and I'm realizing there was a time when I... Somebody said this to me and I was very skeptical, but it, is, it truly is essential because if you can't have grace and compassion for yourself, you can't really have it for other people. Yeah. It's sort of because it's a contradiction to, you know, how they show it in all the other movies where like, like the Wall Street, the Wolf of Wall Street and stuff where oh, yes. if people are motivating themselves, it's like, I can go do it. I can go do it. Versus this is like, it's fine if it didn't work out. So I think we have tools for it. Motivating yourself to be like, you can go do it, but if it doesn't work out, there's nothing like, oh, shoot, then you're down the dumps. When instead you could be using self-compassion and self-acceptance. You know, it's, it, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that we are in a transformational period of time. We are in a sea change where we went from, you know, greed is good and the wolf of Wall Street and all of that and, the, you know, the motivational speakers, go, do, be, and all of these tools to be more. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had a wall because there's only so far you can go. And now we're transitioning into... Okay, so yeah, that has its place, but if that's all you do, that's not going to work. We actually need to get quiet. We need to be contemplative. We need to get back to nature. We need to get back to interpersonal relationships and seeing people in person, not yeah. just over a screen. Yeah, no, so much so that now all of those motivational things are being labeled as toxic positivity. Yes, yes. Then now that's being tuned as, oh, that's toxic to be that positive. You need to be more real. It's like, skip hop and jump sort of thing there <laughs> yeah and generationally there's something really happening with like millennials and gen z and the value systems are changing and so i'm, I'm gen x and it's so funny because my mom who grew up during the during the depression mm -hmm. or right around there she has that toxic po toxic positivity in spades and one day i was talking to her on the phone and she's like oh you just need to look on the bright side I'm like mom i love you but do not invalidate my pain right now. Yeah. I am having a bad day. I need you to let me have a bad day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we have to acknowledge that we have bad days. And, yeah. you know, it, I, I don't want to sort of get rid of the positivity and the motivation. Those are beautiful things. And, you know, positive psychology is a wonderful movement, but it has to be held in balance with rest and reflection and acknowledging that not everything is positive. Yeah. You know, coming back to the theme of balance, light and dark. You have to have both. You cannot have one without the other. Mm. The other thing that really is ramping up right now, and my gosh, in the last three years, it has completely exploded, is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And ketamine is currently, in California anyway, the only legal psychedelic. It's kind of a pseudo-psychedelic. Mm. But we do expect that there are going to be other medicines available in the very near future. But the reason I mention this is that I have seen a very high percentage of people coming in for ketamine psychotherapy, people who are burned out. And they're either people working in tech or in healthcare or in the schools. Yeah. And that is an excellent way to combat burnout because burnout is a very isolated, lonely feeling. And loneliness is, in my mind, a pandemic that's been going on for longer than COVID and exerting a lot of harm. So connecting with sort of the sense of universality through any of the psychedelic medicines can be very healing in a way to combat burnout. Yeah. So what is your general observation with all of these things in hindsight, with burnout, tech industry, normalization, how everything works? What would be your major takeaways that you've absorbed through these things in your personal practice so far for so many years? Well, there is there is something that I've been noticing, and it's, it's correlated with burnout, but it's especially true in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. And that is this concept of neurodiversity and neurodivergence. So let me step back. Neurodiversity, the neurodiversity paradigm, essentially just says that we have to say that our brains are, are structured. That largely comes from the fact that we are born with a lot more neural connections than we have as an adult. And during childhood, up through our early 20s, we go through pruning, where extraneous bits are, are trimmed away, much like pruning and overgrown bush. Mm. Uh, with people who are neurodivergent, so the minority of the population, estimated about 15 to 20 percent, the pruning is not as efficient. 
So there's actually more neural connections that are happening. Mm. That means that somebody who is neurodivergent, which includes me, can get easily overwhelmed by environmental stimuli because we're taking in more information than somebody who is neurotypical. Hmm. So I promise this is going to loop back around and make sense. <laughs> it's, been, it's been noticed for a while, over the last several decades, that there's a higher than average percentage of ADHD and autistic people in the Bay Area. Oh. In the Bay Area. Oh. And those diagnoses that fall within the neurodivergent descriptor. It's not just those two, but those two are, are sort of the central. And people who, are, who have ADD, ADHD or autism are often drawn to tech fields. And there's also a genetic component of this. So the fact that we live in Silicon Valley, which is where, I mean, we are one of the, the major tech hubs in the world, and people are meeting people, engineers are meeting engineers and having babies, and there's a genetic component. So that is increasing that, that relative percentage. Now, the reason this is important is there is something called autistic burnout. Now, autism is, a lot of people have this idea that autism is a screaming child or it's Rain Man. And while that's true, there's a, a beautiful statement that when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. In other words, none of us look like each other. <laughs> We're all very, very different. Yeah. And, and it can be very easy to mask autistic or ADHD traits, and that takes energy. So if you are somebody who is highly sensitive to environmental stimuli, and maybe your brain works in a different way, you know, if you're part of that 20%, if your brain works differently than that 80%, and that 20 to 80 is the population at large, not just Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is in the Bay Area, Bay Area, but I'm sure that the percentage of neurodivergent is higher than that. Oh, okay. Because it requires a lot of energy to sort of modulate the internal experience, people that are neurodivergent can hit burnout a lot faster. Autistic burnout looks like depression. It looks like a major depress depressive episode and it can very easily be misdiagnosed. But the way that you treat major depression is not gonna work for autistic burnout. In fact, it could make it worse. And so that is also a factor to be aware of. I actually just started a group last month for people who are late diagnosed neurodivergent. And it, it's, it filled remarkably fast. We do a lot of group therapy. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of group therapy because of the interrelationships. We need that social interaction. We need reinforcement for peers, but also because there's healing that can happen in a group that doesn't happen just one-to-one. -one. Mm. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of tech people in that group. Mm. Wow. So if someone who's listening, how, or even for me, actually, I'm curious, how do I know whether I'm neurodivergent or not? There, there are a couple of excellent books. My favorite one is actually called Divergent Mind. Mm. There's another book I love by Devin Price called Unmasking Autism. And in an effort for, because I realized I was seeing a lot of neurodivergent clients. I'm like, oh, well, this is interesting. And I started reading these books to try and understand my clients. And I realized I was showing up in these books. Like, holy cow. Wow. Yeah. It was a real eye opener for me. And at first it was, it threw to me. And then I felt like it was very freeing to understand that these are literally brain differences. And neurodivergence is not an ADHD and autism, even though they're called disabilities and deficiencies, they're just a different way of being. And so I think that was really relieving, but what we're not seeing is some of these big companies being able to adjust to their staff who are neurodivergent, who have different needs. And, and that is a real missed opportunity. Mm. So now that you mentioned it's a disability, so there is a way to diagnose this as well? Oh, and, yes. Okay. Yeah. To, to get a formal diagnosis of either ADHD or autism, the, the best way is to get a full neuropsych evaluation, which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. But you don't need a formal diagnosis unless you're looking for like HR accommodations or an IEP or something like that. A lot of people now are self-diagnosing. I do not recommend self-diagnosing on social media because <laughs> yeah. TikTok is going crazy with like therapy talk, I think is what they're calling it. Please don't self-diagnose on social media. Yeah. But maybe read these two books and see if that resonates or listen to some of the podcasts and hold it loosely because we're talking really about neurotypes more so than diagnoses. Yeah. Now, maybe we can go back into the piece where we discussed ketamine psychotherapy and psychedelics and mm -hmm. the growth that you've seen where folks are coming in and asking for more of that because of burnout or whatever trauma and other issues that they might have in life. So 
What is your take on like things that are growing right now with MDMA and others as well? Oh yes, the psychedelic field is is truly exploding, uh, and I've been curious about it because I used to be in big pharma mm-hmm. and used to be intimately involved with clinical trials. I've been watching MDMA for quite some time, mm-hmm. and so for the listeners who who may not be aware, the clinical trials for MDMA assisted therapy have concluded. Stage three has completed and been published, and the results were amazing. Seventy percent remission of PTSD, complex PTSD, which is wow. incredibly high. And then they have also, sorry, reviewed the results and confirmed them. And so now it just, it remains with the FDA to see if that's going to be cleared. I do think it will. If it isn't, that would be shocking to me because the data is incredibly robust. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to say when, when it, it clears FDA is available, it's probably going to come with a lot of restrictions. So it's going to probably only be available for PTSD with possibly only with an index trauma, a very particular trauma that is being targeted. And it will have the same format of the trials, which are these eight hour sessions spaced roughly one month apart with two therapists mm-hmm. present. And now, and I, I was the first ketamine psychotherapist in the South Bay. Oh, wow. But now there's a whole bunch of them. And ketamine is beautiful because number one, it's legal. <laughs> it, it is sort of a pseudo psychedelic. It's legal. Yeah. Unlike the classical psychedelics of LSD, DMT, and psilocybin, and also MDMA, but that's not a classical psychedelic. All of those medications, you can't take an SSRI, an antidepressant, and take those psychedelic medications because there are interactions that can either render the medication inert mm-hmm. or you can have very serious health consequences. Mm-hmm. Ketamine doesn't have that restriction. Mm-hmm. So that makes me very excited. And also the ketamine sessions are very short. Ketamine has a short half-life. So instead of an eight-hour session, you have a three hour session and only an hour and a half of it is when you're under the influence of the medicine. So it's much more accessible Mm -hmm. than the the other medicines. And I think it does have a a huge role to play, partly for dealing with the treatment resistant depression where, because we know that antidepressants work on, you know, there's a good 60% of people that they they don't work adequately. They may work some, but not adequately. Mm -hmm. And I would much rather have somebody try ketamine than go get ECT treatment, for example, which is invasive and causes long-term problems. So it's helpful for depression and for anxiety because it helps to boost neuroplasticity, which Mm -hmm. is creating new pathways in the brain. So letting go of ruminations or limiting core beliefs, but but also, excuse me, it also factors into this sort of search for meaning that we're all going through. The more techy we get and the more disconnected we are from each other and from our own humanity, the more we crave that. So I believe that part of the drive for psychedelics is this need to reconnect with our essential selves and our humanity. Yeah. And all of these medicines have an element of that to it. So there's a craving for spirituality, but if that word makes you uncomfortable, it's, it's a craving for connection. It's a craving for meaning. There has to be more to this world than just collecting a paycheck. Yeah. And we're seeing this in the, in the younger generations. They're like, that. that is not enough for me. Yeah, for sure. I think especially because of the way the state of the world is, everything has become, I think, for, for me as well. And I'm seeing this a lot, like you mentioned, around me too, where people are like, what's the point of all of this? Yes. So. And I don't believe in coincidences. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that things point. happen for a reason. But yeah. we're, we're almost in a global existential crisis mm-hmm. that was, it, it really took off in 2020. And it wasn't just COVID. It was also social unrest. It was the murder of George Floyd. Yeah. It's, it's climate change. And yeah. it, all of this is coming at the same time. And of course, it feels like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I personally believe that you know, nature will find a way. But yeah. it takes a lot to have that faith when we look around and it feels like we're living in chaos. Awesome. So thank you so much for all of these insights for the tech industry here. I'm sure there's a ton for them to gain. So if they really relate to you and want to reach out to your clinical practice that you have here in the Valley, where should they be reaching out? The easiest way is just through our website, which is bayareamentalhealth.com. Mm-hmm. And there, there's an encrypted chat widget. There's, you can also reach us by phone or email. And so that was one of my visions in creating a group practice is to bring together a team approach, a collaborative care approach where we have different areas of specialty. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I've been really enjoying getting to know you in sort of our early conversations and as we've been chatting here today. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. With that, we'll actually be coming around with another episode for psychedelics and ketamine therapy here because 
They are the pros and experts here in the Bay Area. So watch out for that. Cool. Thanks, well, everyone. One of them. I don't want to say we are yeah. the pros. Yes, I'm a good example.